great to see you, Purpose Church. It's an exciting start to the Christmas season. We've got 10 people following Jesus in baptism today um, across all the services. And uh, Merry Christmas month. Uh, you can see some of the decorations in here, but the decorations are just incredible. Uh, all across campus, on our community terrace, we've got a photo booth there just all over the place. It's just absolutely a wonderful time. And the four best Sundays of the year uh, to invite your oikos, the Greek word for household, the 8 to 15 in your sphere of influence, people you work with, go to school with, recreate with, those in your family. The best four Sundays of the year are the next four Sundays so that they can connect with Jesus. You know, we made an interesting discovery during the pandemic. You say, Glenn, can anything good come out of the pandemic? Well, not much, but there was a little. And one of the things we learned is that prior to the pandemic, we had been very event-focused. Things like Easter at Fairplex at the Los Angeles Fairgrounds, uh, things like um, Journey to Bethlehem. Uh, but what we kind of were worried about, even pre-pandemic, and then the pandemic, we discovered it to be true, is that um, when people came to events, they would come back to the event, but they would rarely get connected with a local church or, or with our local church. And so the pandemic forced us for a while, for a couple of years, to focus in on Sundays, make the Sunday special and be more Sunday focused rather than event focused. And as a result, we saw this phenomenal growth that we've seen over the last couple of years because people get connected with the local church. And so that's something we discovered during the pandemic. It's something we're doing now as well for these next four Sundays in the month of December. Each one of them will be special. It's not like we have one big Christmas event and invite your friends to that. No, the next four Sundays, each one of them are going to be special and unique and, uh, uh, and, and powerful. Uh, in uh, the angels, after they had appeared to the shepherds in Luke chapter 2, it says in verse uh, 17, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. This month is our month to spread the word about what has been told us about this child. Now, next Sunday is a great opportunity. December 10th, next Sunday, is our Christmas concert at 10, 3, and 5. And so we won't have our normal schedule. There's no 8.30 service. There's no 11.30 service. There's still three services, but instead of being all in the morning at 8.30, 10, and 11.30, they are at uh, 10 in the morning, uh, identical one at 3 in the afternoon, and at 5 in the evening. So, some of your friends, some of the people in your oikos are morning people. So you invite them to 10 a.m. Some of your oikos are afternoon people. You invite them to 3 p.m. Some of your oikos are evening people. Invite them to 5 uh, p.m. Then uh, December 17th, two Sundays from today, December 17th, uh, we're at our normal schedule at 8.30, 10, and 11.30 with our snow day uh, for the kids. It's going to be just such a great, great, great um, uh, family day. And then uh, on December 24th, Christmas Eve, we're back to that uh, 10 o'clock, 3 p.m., and 5 p.m., uh, schedule. So next Sunday, 10, 3, and 5. The Sunday after that, normal. Uh, the Christmas Eve, special schedule. Then New Year's Eve day, the last Sunday of the month, the uh, last day, I guess it is, of the month. Uh, that one will be back to our normal schedule uh, again. Um, and so, again, let's seize the moment to see everyone everywhere following Jesus. Now, Today we're in the home stretch of our 2023 series in which we've done an overview of the entire Bible in a year. And the title of our series has been Jesus on Every Page. Our series within a series has been the letters that changed history. Now our Bible reading plan this week covers James, 1 Peter, and 2 Peter. But since a couple of years ago we did a verse-by-verse -verse series on 1 Peter, I'm going to concentrate today on the book of James. The title for today's study is James, Jesus, Our Help When Life Gets Hard. Now, December can be an absolutely wonderful time of the year. 
but it can also be a difficult time of the year. Right where you are there watching on your computer or listening in your car or, or uh, there in your living room. Um, how many of you love Christmas? Raise your hand right where you are if you love Christmas. But then a second question, how many of you, even though you love Christmas, can still find it hard at times? My hand is up. I, I wonder if yours is as well. You know, I read an article this uh, past week from the site company called Why the Holiday Season Can Be Difficult. It's, the article starts out, just what is it about the holidays that now stresses us out as adults? when it was nothing but joy and excitement for some of us, at least, as children. What has changed? And here is their list of seven uh, common holiday difficulties. Uh, Seven things that make the holidays uh, difficult. Number one is unrealistic expectations. Like Clark, Clark Griswold in Christmas Vacation, we have unrealistic expectations that are hard to, to meet. Number two, unresolved childhood scars. Sometimes Christmas can bring up painful memories from the past or it's difficult when the family gets together. Number three is the pressure to show off and make other people feel inferior. But then number four is social pressure when other people make us feel inferior, when we compare our Christmas to their Christmas or our lives to their lives. Number five was depression. Uh, that comes from the pressure, stress, and fatigue of the season. Number six is financial pressures, which is, of course, self-explanatory. And then number seven is disappointment. It just seems like Christmas will never be the way it's portrayed in the movies or the way that we idealize it to be. So this is a good time to talk about when life gets hard. But before we do that, let's look at background for the book of James. First of all, it's content. A treatise composed of short moral essays emphasizing endurance and hardship and responsible Christian living with special concern that believers practice what they preach and live together in harmony. The author is James, who uh, we read in Galatians is the brother of, of Jesus. He led the church in Jerusalem for many years, as we saw in Acts, and a few weeks ago, as we saw in Galatians. And eventually, he was killed for his faith, killed for his belief that his brother had resurrected from the dead. I know Pastor Eric often says that's one of the great evidences for the resurrection. If you can convince your brother that you are God in human form, that you, uh, it would take a resurrection to do that. And that's what happened for James. The date that it was written is somewhere between 44 and 49 AD. The recipients are believers in Christ among the Jewish diaspora. Diaspora meaning uh, the Jews were scattered uh, after the fall of, of uh, Jerusalem, the destruction by the Romans. They were scattered all around the Roman Empire. And so um, uh, that happened especially at 70, but it happened even before that uh, here in the 40s AD. And so the diaspora, the Jewish people have been scattered all over uh, the Roman Empire. And then the occasion is unknown, but the treatise shows concern for some real condition in the churches, including severe trials, dissensions, Uh, caused by angry and judgmental words and abuse of the poor by the wealthy. The emphasis is practical faith on the part of believers, joy and patience in the midst of trials, the nature of true Christian wisdom, attitudes of the rich toward the poor, abuse and proper use of the tongue. So let's charge in and read the entire passage, then we're gonna go back and break it down verse by verse. But let's just begin by reading uh, James chapter one, verses one through 12. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. 
But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. But the rich should take pride in their humiliations, since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who, who love him. Three things that are true about trials. Uh, trials here doesn't mean literal legal trials, although in some cases, because of the persecution of the early church, it did involve literal legal trials. But usually it means troubles, difficulties, and challenges. Number one is they are inevitable. Uh, back to verses one and two. James, who is the brother of Jesus, a servant of God of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes, that's another way of saying the Jewish people, scattered among the nations, uh, greetings. Consider it pure joy. Uh, consider it pure joy. Let me ask you a, a question. Uh, right where you are uh, there uh, watching uh, today, what do you consider to be pure joy? We were just uh, visiting our son and, and daughter-in-law and their family. They were their missionaries down in Mexico. And we were in Los Briles. And I'm telling you, it's pretty close to the ultimate paradise. And either swimming in the ocean or sitting by the pool next to the ocean, I said, this is, this is my idea of pure joy. What is it for you? Maybe just kind of if you're with some other people watching, turn to the person next to you. What's pure, what's pure joy for you? Well, I, I, I bet one of our natural answers, it wouldn't be for me, is he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Okay, that, that was not the first thing that popped into my mind. Um, the, the Greek word here for, for tri trials of, of many kinds is um, poikilos, uh, poikilos, um, which means many colored, many kinds. It's from which we get our word polka dotted. It means trouble comes in all types, a variety of all shapes and sizes from all directions. All kinds of different trouble uh, comes in life. There are many types of poikilos, um, uh, types of of, of trouble that happened to us within our lives. It's, it's, it's kind of like this. No, it's fine. Stay to the right.
Trials are inevitable. They come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, number two, they have, a, they have a purpose. They have a purpose behind them. Uh, verse three, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Uh, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Now this word uh, perseverance uh, comes from the Greek word hypoma, uh, hippomone, hippomone, uh, which means tenacity, stick to uh, grit. It says as we go through trials, we build our hippomone. We build our tenacity. We build our stick to We build our, our grit. Our, our grit. Uh, this uh, g- Greek word is, means the quality that enables a person to stand on their feet facing a storm. It's like weights in the gym. Uh, the more weight or the more resistance um, with the more repetition leads to better results. The more you lift and the more often you do it and the more regularly you do it, uh, that, that pushing against the resistance produces the results of more hippomone. Hippomone, perseverance, <coughs> tenacity, <coughs> stick to and, and grit. And the number the third thing about trials is they put things into perspective. You know, trouble makes you think about eternity. (coughs) Trouble uh, makes us pause in life, in the busyness of life, and it makes us focus on eternity. If if you're poor, it makes you long for eternity, James says. If you're rich, it reminds you that all that matters is eternity. Uh, Chapter 1, verse 9, believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position in Christ, their destiny in heaven. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation because it reminds them of of eternity. Since they will pass away like a wildflower, for the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Trouble keeps our priorities straight, and it produces a proper perspective. When a giraffe is born, uh, the first three things that happen to a baby giraffe, number one, they get dropped, what is that, eight to ten feet. That's their welcome to the world. They drop um, eight to ten feet. Number two, their mother kicks them until they stand up. So they drop eight to 10 feet. Number two, they get kicked until they stand up. And then once they stand up, the mother kicks them and knocks them down once again and does this over and over again. Knocks them over, kicks them till they stand up. They stand up, knock them over again, kick them until, and this all happens multiple times after that uh, eight to 10 feet drop. Now, why does the mother do this? Because of two L's. Love and lions. Love and lions. She loves that baby, and she doesn't want it to get eaten by lions. So she takes them through this process so that two things happen. Number one, so that he or she learns to stand. They've got to immediately learn to stand. And and when they're down on the ground, they need to remember how to get back up again. They need to go through it enough times that they know how to stand and they remember how to get back up to their feet again. So in case a lion attacks, they can immediately jump up and run with the other giraffes to get out of trouble. Uh, we've talked before here at, at, at our church about why trouble seems to come in groups. It tends to come in bunches. It, you, you wish trouble would come and then you get about five years to rest up from it and then the next trouble. But it doesn't come that way, does it? It comes in bunches, like it does for this baby giraffe. Trouble comes in a group. The drop, the kicking, the being knocked down. It, in groups, over and over again. Why? So that it will learn, and so that it will remember. And maybe the reason trouble comes in groups for us is so that we can learn how to stand in the Lord's strength, and so we can remember 
to get back up again once we fall down, just like that baby giraffe. Three steps to having victory over trials. Number one, it says consider it pure joy. There's, there's an attitude adjustment. There's a perspective change. There's a paradigm shift. Uh, trouble is something that we uh, don't embrace. We try to avoid. But he says in verse 2, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. He says embrace it. Don't, don't uh, resist it. So we have a change of attitude. And why do we have a change of attitude? Because number two, because we know that the testing develops perseverance. We know that the testing develops perseverance. Now on to verse three. Because you know that the testing uh, of your faith produces perseverance. Um, it, 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 it makes such a difference when you know. It says because you know. When you have an attitude adjustment, you consider it joy. Why do you consider it joy? Because you know. It makes such a difference when you know that there's a purpose behind your suffering. Life is hard. Life hurts sometimes. But it is more bearable if you know that there's a purpose behind your pain. When a student studies, it's hard, particularly if it's a challenging subject for them. But if they know it's eventually for a degree, high school degree or college degree or some other certification, it makes the pain of, su of studying bearable. When an athlete trains, it's hard. But if he or she knows that it's for a championship, it's bearable. When a soldier fights, it's hard. But he or she, it's, it's more bearable when they know it's for a victory. Uh, I often say life is hard enough with Jesus. How does, I can't imagine life without him. What must it be to believe that we live, we suffer, then we die, we turn into dirt, and, and that, that's all she wrote? Uh, no, no wonder people despair. No wonder there's just this despair across our, our nation. Just I, I think we're supposed to set a record for suicides in, in, in the last year. No wonder there's this despair because people are telling us that we are nothing more than a random group of cells experiencing random stimuli, and then we die. There's no purpose in our pain. No wonder people despair outside of Christ. And that's why we share Christ. That's why we hold on to Christ. Why? Because when you're in your pain, when you're, when you're struggling with that trial, if you know that in Christ there is a purpose behind it, then there can even be joy within that trial, as James talks about here. And then number three, let perseverance finish its work. Let perseverance finish its work. Verse four, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Let perseverance do its thing in the middle of your trouble so that you'll grow in maturity, you'll be more complete in Christ, you will have everything he wants you to have. You know, I'll confess to you that my main prayer when I'm in trouble is basically, get me out of trouble. Lord, get me out of trouble. I just repeat it over and over again. Lord, get me out of trouble. Lord, get me out of trouble. Lord, get me out of trouble. That, that is kind of the, the thing I pray over and over again. But James wants us to take a step beyond that. He wants us to cooperate with God, not just get me out of trouble, but God, what do you want to do in my life in the middle of this trouble? You ask the question, what can I learn in the middle of this trouble? What, what can I learn in the middle of this trouble? You know, there are two types of students those that cooperate with their teacher and, and those that don't. There are two types of athletes, those, those that cooperate with their coach and those who don't. I remember once a teammate of mine in track in high school turned to me one day and he says, why do you let the coach treat you like that? Why, why do you let the coach talk to you that way? Why do you allow him to demand so much of you? 
And I was kind of flabbergasted by the question because the coach wanted the best for me. He wanted me to stretch myself, to go beyond where I was. That's why you cooperate with the coach or with the teacher. And there are two types of Christians. Those who become bitter against God for their trouble in their life or those who cooperate with God in getting the most out of this time of, 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 of trouble. Um, let's see if we can get the most out of it. How, how can we cooperate with him? Let perseverance finish its work in the middle of your trial, in the middle of your trouble, so that you can become mature and complete, not lacking anything. That's what your heavenly Father wants for you. So that's why he wants you to cooperate with him, not fight against it. Now, two reasons why trials often defeat us. Number one, because of a lack of, of wisdom. We need to ask God two questions. We need to ask him the what question and the how question. First of all, what can I learn during this time of trouble? And secondly, how should I handle myself during this time of trouble? I want you to think of some trouble in your life right now. Right now, just, just think of something you're going through that's hard right now. And ask those two questions. Lord, what can I learn, not just all my obsession and all my prayers be about, Lord, get me out of this trouble, but Lord, what can I learn from this time of trouble, in, in the middle of this time in trouble? What can I learn about God? What can I learn about other people? What can I learn about myself? And then how should I handle myself during this time of trouble? Lord, Lord how do you want me uh, to respond? How do you want me to grow? James 1 Verse uh, five uh, says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. And then uh, uh, another uh, reason that we trials that often uh, defeat us is because of a lack of faith. He says, continuing in verse six, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. Now the good news is that he's talking about faith here and not perfect faith. Not perfect faith, uh, never doubting, not, not 100% faith, uh, faith, but not perfect faith. I, I love the story in Mark chapter 9, where a father brings his son to Jesus and says, Jesus, will you heal my son? And Jesus said, well, I can if you believe. And then the father says, Lord, I believe, help me with my unbelief. And I love that story, because Jesus doesn't say to him, well, come back to me when you've got perfect faith. He says, I can work with that. Lord, I believe, help me with my unbelief. And Jesus heals his son, and he'll do the same for us. See, not being double-minded means that we believe that God knows what he's doing in our life. God knows what he's doing in your life. And number two, we submit our will to his will in what he is doing within our lives. To be double-minded, uh, to be double-minded, as James talks about here, is to hold on to my will and God's will at the same time. That's what it means to be double-minded. Clinging to my own will, my own way, and God's will and God's way, trying to do both of them at the same time. That's what James means here by being double-minded. Let me give you a picture of what I'm uh, talking about. Here's how you get uh, a, a pet baboon. First of all, you dig a hole in a gigantic anthill. And then you place some wild melon seeds and, and you put it in there, in, in, into the anthill and hole, and you do it in the baboon's presence because they are incredibly curious. That baboon is very interested. Now he's nervous about you because you're human. He's not sure about that, but he's got such incredible curiosity. And eventually he just can't take it anymore and so his, his, his curiosity is going to overcome his fear, and he's going to put his hand in and uh, grab the melon seeds. 
But once he grabs them, he refuses to release them. But he can't get his hand out when it's in a fist. But he can't bring himself to do it. At any moment, this baboon can be completely free if he will just let go of the melon seeds. Now this is, this is such a great picture of the Christian life. We hold on to our will even when it enslaves us. And James says, don't be double-minded holding on to my will and God's will, trying to do both at the same time. But unlike that baboon, who is now the pet for, for somebody, unlike that baboon, release, release the grip on that area of your life that you don't want to give to God. Release the hold on stubbornly holding on to my will. And open-handedly say, God, thy will be done. And that's where freedom and joy happen within the Christian life. Two results of applying these spiritual principles. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed, blessed, happy is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Uh, what do you get from it? You get genuine happiness, not based on external circumstances, but an internal joy uh, this side of heaven. Uh, it's, it says here, uh, has stood the test. You'll, you'll have the joy of knowing that you've stood the test. It comes from the Greek word dokimos, which means has stood the test. Uh, it's, it's the same word that's used for the successful testing of precious metals and coins. You, you've been refined in the refiner's fire like a precious metal, like a precious coin. You, you, you dokimos, you, you have stood the test and there is genuine happiness in doing that this side of heaven. But then there's, there's eternity involved as well. You get the crown of life. You get genuine happiness this side of heaven and the crown of life, eternal reward on the other side of heaven. Now, the crown of life sometimes refers to a kingly crown, but usually it refers to the crown that was given to a victorious athlete. It was made of laurel or oak or even celery. They'd weave it together for this victor's crown. And that's what, we're, that's what we'll receive from Christ when we persevere through the trials of this life into eternity, into heaven. You know, last Sunday we were at our son John's church in, in uh, Mexico where he's a pastor in Los Briles in Mexico, as I mentioned earlier. And I saw just such a beautiful picture of the Christian life because in the middle of the worship service, a young man had an epileptic seizure. And yet nobody panicked. The person sitting next to him in church just simply picked him up and carried him to a more open area and put him down, and, and the church gathered around him, and they kind of held his hands and, and, and encouraged him until the seizure passed. And then they picked him up to his feet, put him back in his seat once again. The gentleman that had been helping him sat down next to him, and they continued the worship service. And I thought, what a beautiful picture of the Christian life. Going through life together, through the trials, picking each other up when we fall down, uh, with Christ's help, standing up with his, his help and encouragement, persevering through the trials, uh, receiving genuine joy that knows that he's doing his work within us through those trials. He has his ultimate purpose. And then through that, on our way to eternity in heaven. Lord, I pray for each person that's been watching here today. And Lord, I pray that whatever trouble they're going through, Lord, I pray that your word would be an encouragement to them that to not despair, to not be discouraged, to know that you are at work even in the middle of that trial, even in the middle of that trouble, Lord, and, and that they would be able to persevere through it knowing that you have your ultimate purpose for them and that we would feel the joy that comes from knowing that we are growing into maturity in Christ through the trials of life. And then the joy of the victor's crown 
uh, the, the crown, uh, the, 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 the victory crown that we receive from Christ as we enter in to his presence in heaven. Give us joy and encouragement through your word today. And we pray this in Jesus' name and all God's family said, amen.